This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Tens of millions of meetings are conducted every single day. And we're all, all of us listening, participating in this, are part of those meetings. The question is, how do we make a meeting better than no meeting at all? And how do we actually make them productive? And we have the expert on this, Stephen Rogelberg, who has de really devoted his life to this topic. So Stephen, it is just delightful to have you on our show. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's kind of scary to say my life, but definitely the last <laughs> couple of decades, I have been heavily involved in doing a ton of research on the topic. Well, I love that. So if you would just, you know, give us a little background and how'd you get into, you know, researching meetings? Yeah. So as an organizational psychologist, I am drawn to study pain at work and try to figure out science to help address it. And clearly meetings are a pain point in organizations. And um, so I wanted to be, you know, part of that conversation. How can we make these things work? Especially because a world without meetings is actually quite problematic, right? Meetings are where organizational democracy takes place, communication, cooperation, consensus, decision-making. Um, so we need meetings, but what we don't need is bad meetings, wasted time in meetings. And we can do something about that. And that's really what I was hoping to do with, you know, both of my books. So obviously I've been publishing actively um, in the academic literature and then, you know, really for the last seven years, been going hard in the trade literature. So I have a bunch of pieces in Harvard Business Review. And then my first book, The Surprising Science of Meetings, um, did super well. I mean, there was such an appetite for the science around this. And then my new book, Glad We Met, um, The Art and Science of One-on-One -on -one Meetings, I think is a shines a really bright spotlight on a meeting that can change lives. And that's the one-on-one -on -one meeting. Well, I, I, I love all this because <laughs> I... I had a, a years and years ago, I was listening to a, a speaker and he was talking about to a, a, actually a religious group. And he's saying, um, we should really think about, do we need all the meetings we have? Because uh, meetings got to be a really good meeting to be better than no yeah. meeting at all. Right. And I, I've subscribed to that for the last 30 years uh, since I heard that, because I totally believe that. I mean, a, a bad meeting, there's really yeah. no worse waste of time than a bad meeting. I will, on the other hand, say that if you look at my, if you were to look at my calendar, Stephen, you'd see that I schedule every hour of my day. It's either scheduled for no meetings or it's scheduled for particular meetings. And so, and those meetings can range from uh, a company meeting to a, um, uh, to, uh, to one on one meetings, um, to uh, leadership meetings. And so I, I, what I'd kind of like to do is I, I'd like to explore with you. I'm going to give personal examples. I, I hope everybody is okay with that. But this is near and dear to my heart because I spend probably, I would guess, a good 20 hours a week in meetings of one sort or another. Okay. So it could be a, a you know, they could be one-on-one -on -one with a client or they could be anywhere from, or, or they're, they're talking to a potential business associate or, you know, whatever that is. But let's start with kind of a broad, let's go broad first and then we'll get a little narrower. What's the science behind a successful meeting? I mean, what is the basic science behind a successful meeting? What makes a good meeting? What makes a bad meeting? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, yeah, do that, you know, 30 seconds or less. So I'll just say, um, you know, the characteristics of a bad meeting is where you're meeting just for the sake of meeting, you're meeting out of habit. There's not a compelling purpose. There's not intentionality around who you invite. You tend to over-invite. When people show up, um, you know, they don't know why they're there. And then you don't facilitate conversation. You dominate the conversation as the meeting leader. Mm. And um, so there's just, there's very few voices talking. There's lots of voices staying silent, multitasking. And then at the end, there is a lack of clarity around what was actually discussed and decided. And as a result, people feel, you know, people leave the meeting wondering what were the outcomes. So when you put that whole package together, it's pretty horrible. 
right? So people gave you the greatest gift that they have, time. which is their time, and you weren't a good steward of it. And so not only did they waste time, but there were opportunity costs, right? They could have been doing right. something else. And then what we find is that when people attend a bad meeting, they are subject to something called meeting recovery syndrome. And this is the idea that when we have a bad meeting, it sticks with us. We ruminate, we co-ruminate, oh, right? my heavens. we can't keep it to ourselves. And we have a bad meeting, we have to tell someone else. And so there's a host of negative consequences associated with these bad meetings. Okay, so so let's walk through some you know good meeting uh, strategies and tactics um, just generally, um, yeah. uh, and and let me throw one out. This is one we use, um, which you, you talk about intentionality, and uh, um, you probably noticed when we were first on the call, I told you how long it's going to be. I, I I told you what we're going to do, and uh, you know kind of what the outcome is going to be, and. We call that an upfront contract. Actually, we borrowed that from the Sandler Sales Institute, and uh, and and that has, when we do that, it seems to work. So, what? Why does why does that why does that work? Sure, I mean it's good leadership. You know, you're conveying that you've actually thought about this activity, um, and that you're being planful and mindful. Um, that is a huge step. I mean, so often people call meetings, um, again, kind of out of that habit um, without thinking through it. So, you know, the the contractual elements that you're discussing, the actual elements, I think, matter less than the fact that by doing it, you're actually thinking it. about the experience. Um, you know, so here, I'm going to give you an, another example. Would you like another example? Please, 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 please. So this is a, it's adjacent to the contractual elements, but you'll see the connection. So most meetings, as you know, um, when they have an agenda, they, the agenda is typically a set of topics to be discussed. You know, what I wanna challenge meeting leaders is to frame their agenda as a set of questions to be answered. Yes. And by framing your agenda as a set of questions to be answered, now you have to stop and really think about why you're having the meeting, right? It's about addressing these questions. You have a better sense of who needs to be at the meeting, right? Because these are the folks that are relevant to the questions. You know if the meeting is effective or sat satisfying because the questions have been answered. And having your agenda framed as questions creates an engaging challenge that draws people in. And if you just can't think of any questions, Tom, what does it mean? If you can't think of any questions. <laughs> Better not to have the meeting. <laughs> exactly. You know, why, why, why do you need the meeting if you don't have questions? Yeah. I want to explore that a little bit because, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years is the person who's asking the questions is in control of the conversation, first yeah. of all. Second of all, I want to know. We follow a lot of the Gina Wickman's protocol on, you know, entrepreneurial operating system, right? EOS, which Gino's in a mastermind group with me. And, uh, Brilliant, you know, brilliant because the meetings are all very, they're structured, but they're very much about the question. But here's my question for you. Sure. What makes a good question to go into a meeting? Yeah. Um, and what makes a bad question? Good question. You know, basically we want to borrow from what we know about goal setting. A question is very much like a goal. And so what we know about setting goals is they should be specific they should be relevant, they should be measurable, um, they should be challenging, but not over the top. Those are the characteristics of a good question. Good question lays out a challenge that's relevant, meaningful, important. Um, it's doable in that meeting to discuss it um, and is specific enough to yield good engagement. I, I like it. Give us a couple of uh, examples of just meetings you've been in or meetings mm -hmm. you've seen that are just terrible. I mean, we want, we want to hear the dirt here, Stephen. So many, but I will say this one thing. I, you know, as you know, if you go to my website, I, I do a lot of national media and one of the national media outlets, I'm, I don't think I'm going to name them, but you go to my website, Probably wise. figure it out. Um, so one of the things they asked me to do is after my segment, they said, Hey, can you attend one of our meetings? and give us feedback. That meeting was so bad. 
they basically had a table surrounded by a, a second row of chairs. So you had people around the table and then another table completely around that. So you sounds, could like, just, sounds like a military meeting, right? Right. And so government meeting. So that's the setting, right? And you want conversation. I mean, you're just, that's just not going to work, right? So you have 40 people around a conference table twice. And then basically the leader is asking folks to make pitches, um, which is a very meaningful activity, but there's actually no guidance around how to do these pitches. So some people's pitches were 30 seconds. Other people's pitches were multiple minutes. And they talked, they included different content in that. So there was no collective sense making around these pitches and how to do them quickly and efficiently. And therefore people were up left to their own devices. Some were succinct, some weren't. So quickly, this meeting just didn't have any coherence to it. And so this lack of coherence, the lack of ability to actually create meaningful dialogue, given the shape of the room, packed people, um, you know, just led to just tremendous dysfunction. So what did you tell them? To not do that. <laughs> <laughs> to stop. Um, you know, the other example of a bad meeting that just drives me batty is when the, the agenda is recycled meeting to meeting. Oh, yeah. You know, where you literally, you get the agenda and it's the exact same thing. And you're like, okay, yeah, you haven't thought about this. Another thing that's a real pet peeve of mine is, and I know, Tom, you're going to, you're going to feel my pain on this. Another pet peeve is, you know, going to a meeting and it's just people doing status updates oh. one time. Um, and it's just so ridiculous. Um, so, right. So let me ask you a question about this, because this is, this, this is, I, I do feel that pain. Um, one of the things that we've kind of adopted in my, my company is, um, if it could be communicated by email, yeah. don't put it in a meeting. In other words, if it's factual and it's just like, uh, uh, you know, or it's one person or something like that, do we really need a meeting for this? Could we, re couldn't we just do this in a quick back and forth? And we then in an email, we actually have a document, right? Which we don't in necessarily in a meeting. Um, so um, thoughts. Yeah, that's great. I mean, basically, we have lots of ways of communicating with one another. And um, we should utilize all those various tools. So if we don't need engagement with the material, that's a good candidate for an email, right? If we need engagement with the material, now you're moving more into the meeting setting. So the lack of engagement is, is really the critical piece. The other thing is, it doesn't always have to be an email. So we have other options. Right. Um, you know, we can use asynchronous documents to create a, good conversations that are distributed um, across geographies, across time zones. Also, we're in the podcast world now. People love listening to podcasts at their convenience. There's nothing that stops a manager from recording themselves sharing right. the information. And that's so easy to do, right? We record ourselves all the time. It's not hard anymore. And uh, so we could do a recording. Hey, everyone, I have 10 key points that I want to start the day with. Um, you Here they are. If you have any questions, you know, I will make sure I have office hours at this time. Here we go. Bang. And they send it out. You know, that's a great way of getting out information, right? You're still keeping the door open for conversation, but it's efficient. And typically the, one of the things that people love about podcasts, besides the one I just mentioned in terms of being listening at your convenience, is that you can listen it at faster speeds. And the fact right. is people do listen, they can listen at higher speeds than people generally talk. So this is another form of efficiency. The other bonus that when we do some of these alternative strategies, then people can place that activity into their calendar such that every day they have some larger windows for deep work, right? They're not constantly being interrupted. Right, right, right. And I, I love that. That's that. That's why I say, I mean, I have that on my calendar. I actually set that aside. Good. Do not do not expect to get a meeting during this time because I will be working. <laughs> I have to do a deep dive here. So. Yep. So let's dive a little bit into one-on-one -on -one meetings since th yeah. this is your new book. Um, glad we met. Um, hey, I'm glad we met too. Ditto. 
Absolutely. This is awesome. Uh, I, I love, I, so I, I have a, n a lot of questions on one-on-one, -on -one, but yeah. I'm going to let you set this up okay. as to when you're doing a one-on-one -on -one meeting, can you kind of walk us through the do's and don'ts of a one-on-one -on -one meeting other than the general things that we've talked about? So let's make sure that um, we fully understand the concept. Um, and we have tons of one-on-one -on -one encounters with people, right? We bump into people, you know, we have quick updates, like we're, we talk to people. So there's tons of one-on-one -on -one encounters. So what I mean by a one-on-one -on -one meeting is something very intentional. This is something a manager does where they have a regular and reoccurring meeting with their directs to discuss what's on the minds of their directs. It's their opportunity for the manager to truly see their people, to understand their needs, to understand um, their concerns, understand where they might need support. So it's a meeting facilitated and orchestrated by a manager, but it is not for them. It is for their people. And this type of a meeting is the one meeting that should never be an email. This meeting is where you truly connect with those who, re who work for you. So it's absolutely critical, especially as workplaces are more distributed than ever, right. right? People have this lack of connection. So managers need to recognize that one-on-one -on -one meetings are the core, the essence of being a leader. It's not an optional activity. And the exciting thing is, is that, that these one-on-ones yield tremendous outcomes. We've seen that employee engagement is higher, when they have employees report having these one-on-one -on -one meetings, thriving is higher. Retention is higher. You keep your best talent, um, right? We've all heard the adage that people don't leave bad jobs. They leave bad bosses. Well, this is your opportunity to prove you're not a bad boss. There's also linkages between performance, right? Because these things direct, bar you know, they, can, they confront barriers. Um, there's research to show that it improves team performance. So when you think about improving individual performance, team performance, more retention, these are all things that dramatically help a manager. Managers are evaluated based on the success of their people. Right. So these one-on-ones are an investment that pays dividends for the manager. And so it's not an optional activity. It's an essential and critical activity. Um, so let me pause there. I can definitely get into some do's and don'ts. I, 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 I've got a, got a question for you. First yeah. of all is... Frequency mm. is the first one. So yeah. you're saying they're critical. They're not an, an option. You make it about them. Yep. I love that. Um, yep. How often? Good. Well, um, so we can look at a few different sources. One is when we did research asking people their desired cadence, the typical response was every week. And interestingly, the more senior employees they desire that even more. So counter to generational stereotypes. So the desired preference is every week. What we find in the research is that the most gains in engagement were associated with weekly or every other week. And then it drops down after that. So a monthly meeting model, it can work. It's better than nothing, but it's not nearly as it's good. It's not optimal. No, because you just don't build any continuity, right? I, it doesn't feel like a connection. It's uh, when you've done your studies, have you found there's an old, uh, there's an ideal amount of time uh, for that meeting? No, we haven't. Um, that what it really seems to come down to is less about the sheer amount of minutes and more about those quality of those minutes, right? So if you and I have a really meaningful conversation for 15 minutes where we're really engaging and I'm listening hard. That's very satisfying, you know, versus a 60 minute where there's just garbage, right? And we can see this in the podcast world, right? It's all about quality of engagement. Um, you know, your, your show is 30 minutes, but clearly you're prepared. It's targeted, it's focused. It's a great 30 minutes. So it's really about how the manager approaches the engagement more than the absolute minutes. Okay, I like that because I, I can just I could just hear you know um, owner entrepreneurs and yep. managers going, well, wait a minute, that 
that's a lot of meetings. Um, right. 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 And, and, and the other problem is of course, is that nature abhors a vacuum. Right. So that means that we'll, if we schedule an hour, we'll take an hour. Well, for sure. Um, but I do want to say that managers will save time with this. They, they will save time. Like it is, if you go down this spiral of saying, I don't have time, that's a huge mistake. These meetings prevent rework. These meetings get people aligned. These meetings allow people to get their stuff done more efficiently. And then we even have managers reporting that they tend not to get in, as interrupted as much when they have these regular one-on-ones because the employees save their issues for the one-on-ones. And then obviously these things elevate performance of individuals and teams. So that's a positive. Also, you know how long it takes to replace good talent. So hard. Goodness, right? So it's a small, relative to the gains, this is a small investment. If if a manager says at the time, you know, my first recommendation is, okay, fine. Well, then reduce the amount of time of these one-on-ones or do them every other week to, to reclaim some time. Um, but not doing them is not an option. If you want to be successful, you have to do them, right? Yeah. We know this is just the, the basics of where we are with humanity. People like to be seen. And think about what it signals to your people if you choose not to find the time to do these. Th that is a heck of a signal that is going to hurt your effectiveness. No, I, I love that. All right, so do's and don'ts. <laughs> well, we, okay. So do get the book um, because that has a ton of do's and don'ts. Um, but, and I will give, you know, the, the gratuitous plug. I know, you know, to glad we met the art and science of one-on-one -on -one meetings. I'm plugging it, but it's not because of personal game, gain. I'm donating all my royalties to the American Cancer Society. So there's no personal gain. I just want to get the content out there. It's really important right. and meaningful and valuable. So I hope people will buy the book to learn do's and don'ts or buy the book if they want to help eradicate cancer. All right. So I'll give you a few quickies though. So we already talked about cadence. So that's great. Um, the, a big don't is falling into a status update trap. These meetings are not for the manager to get their needs met. They can find out status on many different ways, right? That could be asynchronously. That could be an email. They don't need, this meeting is not to do that. This meeting is to hear what's on the minds of their people. So don't fall into that status update trap. Second, you know, procedurally, you have to really listen. You have to talk less than your direct. And what we found in the research is the more the manager talks, the lower the ratings of effectiveness. And this is hard for, for people because research shows that when we talk a lot, it triggers the same parts of our brain as sex and good food. So we need to provide that gift to our people, not ourselves. So we need to talk less. We need to ask good questions. We have to make sure there's a great close where there's clarity around what who's committing to what. And all throughout, the manager is just conveying support, listening, being appropriately vulnerable. Um, and I do want to say um, they're asking really good questions that allow the direct to express themselves. And the questions could be about the job, the team, the organization, careers, short-term, long-term. So we're sampling. And you know, in my book, I give all these various options. But the questions are also thoughtfully asked. And I want to give you an example um, and I can't believe we're almost out of time. This went so fast, but I'm going to give you an example. One of the classic questions to ask in a one-on-one -on -one is simply, how are you? Right? That's very standard. Well, great question that doesn't work. When you ask someone, how are you? It typically triggers an automatic response. I'm fine. Good. Pretty good. Great. Um, that doesn't give you much. But there's a tiny tweak that the research shows yields very different responses. If I ask you, Tom, I'm interested in how you are, but 
But I'd like you to answer that question on a 10 point scale with one being horrible and 10 being great. How are you? Now you have to think. You have to translate it to a number. And you're going to give me probably a number that's going to be more like a seven, a six, or a five. And then I can say, ah, tell me more about that. What can I do to help you get up to being an eight? Right? So you even the slight tweak on a question can yield a really meaningful opportunity for engagement. I love it. Um, anything different that you do depending on who you're meeting with. So you're talking about managers. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap up with this, but we also have meetings with clients. We have meeting with vendors, anything different that you do with different types yeah. of engagement. Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, that's the neat thing about this content is, is we do have lots of different one-on-one -on -one engagements. And so the book um, definitely features uh, the manager and the direct, but there are but I also point out clear opportunities for how this translates to, to meetings with those other groups. You know, the fundamentals of a good one-on-one -on -one with your direct are absolutely the good fundamentals to have a good one-on-one -on -one with these other sources, including your children. And so, yes, the research supports that you should be having one-on-ones with your kids. Now, I'm not talking about these rigorous calendar holds. I'm talking about finding time, being intentional to have a one on one with your kid on a regular basis where you just listen and understand what's on their minds. And so a lot of the techniques, approaches, um, activities, they absolutely relate to all kinds of one on one engagements. I love it. Thank you. Um, Stephen Rogelberg.com. It's uh, been great to have you. The book is Glad We Met The Art and Science of One and One to One Meetings. Um, any final comments? Stephen? Oh, thank you so much. And definitely um, encourage folks to check out stephenrogelberg.com. I have a ton of resources that are free for folks. Um, definitely, you know, check out the book. I hope they will. Um, you know, that's really, you know, it's my hope. And um, yeah, no, I, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and your audience. Thank you for being a good steward of my time. Thank you for being thoughtful and asking great questions and listening. And it was an enjoyable uh, engagement. Thank you. No, thank you. And remember, everyone, that, you know, this is a tool uh, that it's like a sword that has two sides, right? <laughs> it can be really good. It can be really bad. Uh, when we have better meetings, when we're more intentional with meetings, when we set that contract, when we listen, we ask thoughtful um, questions, then what we're all, we'll always end up with is way more money and way less tax. We'll see you all next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.